welcome to this walkthrough of the O2 contract. My name is Holly Jervis and I'm the Partner Experience Leader for Chess Partner. In this short video, we're just going to run through the key points and things you need to remember when filling out the O2 contract. Now, for those of you that have been doing O2 for a long time, it probably seems a little bit like I'm going over old ground. However, recently, a lot of you will have been privy to an O2 audit where we have been checking the paperwork on behalf of O2 for compliance and making any suggestions as we go along. Now, O2 do have some things they need to do on the contract, but until that changes, we need to make the, the contract work for us to be compliant and be operating under the best business practice rules. So this is just a short walkthrough to make sure you've got all the relevant bits walking through. If you're completely new to O2, then it's a clean slate and we can make sure that you've got all the bits and bobs that you need to make sure that your contract goes through right first time. So I've pre-filled out quite a lot, so we're going to do a little bit of a whistle-stop tour around this, starting on the top right of the screen. So this PDF version is essentially just a copy of the old white, pink and blue carbon contracts that you used to get in the stores. Now, we're not giving a pink and blue copy and putting them in different places, giving to customers and to ourselves, because we're trying to remain as paperless as possible. But we do need to know who the retailer is, your SOS code, which was provided to you at the time when you received your O2 revenue share code. We need to know the manager and salesperson and the contact telephone number. Now, believe it or not, O2 aren't too fussed about a signature there. But when they are looking at the audit paper trail, they would like to see a trail of who was responsible for the original sale. They know that people do change throughout the business. People move, people leave. But still, what they'd like to try and do is capture in real time who was responsible at every part of the journey. So make sure you're filling that out on the top right to start with. It's even worth noting you can fill that out and save a copy for each individual salesperson to save yourself repeating every single time. Moving down then into section one about you and your company. So company details, important to have the company name, address in full and postcode as it will appear on a credit vet form. They also need a contact number and of course an email address as well. Now this is just in case O2 do need to make contact. It also shows carrying through all the contact details remain the same on every piece of paperwork. Now if you're sitting there thinking well I don't want it to be that, I need the, the bill going somewhere else, I need to give you different information for that, well that's absolutely fine, we're going to pop that in in just a moment. Now, in the case of a limited company, then if you look at the bo box below, then you will be asked for the registered office. So you need to make sure that even if the company name and address and registered office are the same, you are duplicating that information. And most importantly, for limited or any companies that carry a reg number, then you do need to include that as well. Another top tip as well that we've learned through the auditing process is that a lot of the uh, rejections that we see are based on the fact that the company name looks like it's incorrect. Now, on paper to you, it may not look incorrect. You may have simply abbreviated limited to LTD, but if it's been credit vetted on O2 with Chess Partner Limited written in full, then that is what they need to see on the contract as well. Something as small as that can cause a rejection and a minimum 24 hour delay, which we don't want. Underneath our company details, there we've got our invoice address. So as I said at the beginning, if you want the bill going somewhere else, then that's absolutely fine. Now, obviously we are now in the age of digital. So all invoices are by default popped onto the uh, the, the O2 billing platform, my O2 business. But in case your customer opts for a paper bill, then pop that invoice address in there. As you can see, I've put it as differing and that it is Chess House Alderly Edge. So next up, going over onto the right hand side of the contract, we've got director details. So obviously only needed if we are dealing with a limited company. And yes, you do need to include date of birth and a contact telephone number. Because again, if this is referred to credit management or it is checked in any further detail other than via automation, then they will need that information to prevent any delay moving forward. 
box number four, delivery address. This is only required if there is kit involved. Now, this doesn't relate to kit that you may be ordering separately from O2, such as via Tech Data or the Chess Hardware team. The delivery address box on the O2 contract solely relates if on this O2 deal, O2 are providing a handset locked to their network sent out to the customer. If that isn't the case and you are ordering separate hardware, you do not need to put a delivery address on this form. Moving down then into about your new mobiles and services. So section five, we need to make a model. Now, I do get a lot from partners saying, well, we've got 100 handsets. I'm not going to put them all there. Of course, you're not. Absolutely not. So what I recommend here after going through the O2 audits is that you are putting a make and model in there. So if you've got a number of handsets and they're a mixture of iPhone and smartphone, just to pick the two major players, and if I can spell correctly, then we just need to indicate that we are doing a mixture of handsets. We've got please tick if upgrading. Now this gets missed a lot. So if this is not a brand new connection, but a re-sign, then this box will need to be ticked. Underneath a mobile number. Now, again, if you've got a hundred lines, then this isn't going to cut it for you. But what they do need to see is they need to see a mobile number that is re-signing on the account. But if it is a brand new account, there will be no mobile number. And instead you will give a SIM card reference. This is simply just to tie it in with any purchase order and automation hub that is coming through. I'll tell you what you do if you've got more than one, which most of you do in just a moment. IMEI number is optional. It does make it easier for the network with lost and stolen bars, but of course, if they don't have the IMEI number, it isn't impossible. It's just to do with logging, helping with APN issues, and of course, the speed in which the lost and stolen bar can be placed. If this is a brand new contract and it is not an upgrading customer, you will need to provide your credit vet reference number. Now, ultimately, we know that the credit vet reference number has in front of it the letters BG, that's Bravo Golf, dash, and then some numbers. We know that the BG exists. Unfortunately, on the PDF version of this contract, O2 haven't made it possible for us to enter uh, letters. They've only made it possible to enter numbers. So do make sure you put the number in. If you want to write BG, uh, if you are doing this by hand, then you can. But ultimately, we will not be rejecting when we do the check on this because the BG is missing. We would only do that if it is missing on the automation hub because that will prevent it from going through. If you are upgrading, not for a new account as you won't have one yet, but if you are upgrading, you need to provide, of course, the O2 account number. If you're porting into an existing account, you're porting into a new account, we need a pack code. If you've got numerous pack codes, please put one in the box and then I'll tell you where the rest go in just a moment. Number six is the customer requirements form attached. Now this is no longer needed unless you are on a legacy tariff called best for business. So it's safe to say for the majority of you watching this, no is selected. Seven is service information minimum period. So you may have a number of different varying lengths on this contract. You need to go for the highest number of months that you are contracting for. So in this case, I've chosen 24, but you may be dealing with 36 or simply just 12 months. If you are dealing with a 30 day rolling contract, then simply put one in the months. Eight, this covers call bars. so. Unless you tell us otherwise, call bars will be added to the, uh, the line. Of course, the Automation Hub as well also covers this. But again, for continuity through the paperwork, if you are not requesting call bars on your Automation Hub, then you should be popping the same information on the contract form. So I'm saying that, yes, I want to be able to roam. And yes, I want to be able to call abroad at the moment. Remember. This is not something that is contractable that can't be changed. A phone call to your support team can get this changed without uh, any issue whatsoever with the network. Right, box number nine. I get asked about this a lot. 
I feel it's quite self-explanatory. So if your customer is VAT exempt, then you will need to make sure that these boxes are ticked. It usually relates to an individual resident or business outside the European Union. Now, obviously, we are going through a state of flux at the moment with that. That's putting it mildly. Um, so we will see this contract change when there is clarity about the Brexit situation. But for now, if you are dealing with a VAT exam customer outside of the European Union, then you will need to make sure your boxes are ticked. Right hand side. Box number 10, monthly charges, call business plan. Okay, so this is where we need to see the lead number and any subsequent bolt-ons further down this column uh, that you want to put on your contract. Now, again, I know many of you do more than one number, so I will tell you what you need to do in the event of having different tariffs and also multiple numbers and not enough space. So, I've put an example here, a small biz, six gig, and the price excluding that is £20. Now, I've put that as my call plan. Underneath, you will see the box say business data tariff. You do not need to split small biz and then six gig underneath it. It is quite acceptable to write the full tariff name and the price X VAT in business call plan in that box at the top there. Number 11 allows you to add up to 10 optional extras, including shared minute bolt-ons and messaging. So I'm going to explain a shorthand way to do multiple numbers on the same tariff. If they differ, then I will give you some tips in a moment. For this, I want to say that I'm having 10 small business at 6 gig. I would change my costings. XVAT, of course, and then down in my optional extras, you can see that I put an example of EU to EU minutes and the bolt-on price and also Wi-Fi calling, which is free, but I've just felt that in the sake of keeping everything clear, I wanted to put this on the contract. Again, it's something that can be picked up and put down along with things like EU minute bolt-ons, extra um, data bolt-ons. Uh, they can be added uh, in there and taken out as you go through the life cycle of the contract. For example, I want all my numbers to have the 10 EU minutes every month and every single one to have Wi-Fi calling, which doesn't cost us anything. So instead of £25 for my one number, I would simply change that to reflect the grand total every month that I can expect to pay for my 10 numbers. In 13, one-off payments, connection and roaming deposit. Now, you will be notified if during the credit vet process there is any such deposit required. Otherwise, you can leave this blank or simply put in zero as the total. And box 14 may well just be a duplication of box number 12, but still, best practice states, we need to see it. We need to see continuity and we need to see that there is absolute transparency from the top of box 10 through 11, down to 12 and 14. Now, this is our saving grace. I'm not going to sit here and lie. There are some things missing from the O2 contract, which O2 are fully aware of and working to correct. But the special instruction slash promotions box has become a little bit of a safe haven for the things that are missing or to clarify a complicated deal or something that has a lot of bells and whistles. So in the special instructions box, I have put some examples of clarity that I've seen through the O2 auditing process with our partners. Now, spend caps came in on the 1st of October 2018, and you'll notice that there is not a spend cap option on the contract. So, in box number 15, we advise you to place the information about spend caps. It tells the network that you have discussed this with your customer, and it will show continuity as the spend cap amount being set will feature on the automation hub. So I've put spend caps set at five pounds. If all my numbers have different spend caps, then I would simply put the spend cap set at five, 10, 15, and so on. I also want to clarify that I allow roaming. Again, this confirms what I've placed here above in box number eight and also what features on the automation hub. 
I've clarified that my six gigabyte deal is a double data promo. Now, with some deals, we see something called a BCAD, so that's your discount. It can be on line rental, it can be on a handset. Now, these deals often are on sharer plans and spend caps aren't allowed, so we wouldn't see spend cap information in the box if it was a sharer plan, but we might see a partner place the BCAD information again, so there is complete clarity from the purchase order to the contract to the automation hub, which will feature the BCAD so it can be processed with its discount. And you can see underneath the final line, see continuation sheet for extra lines. Now, what I've seen from quite a few partners is I have seen an Excel document uh, that has been created, a table that features, especially in a re-sign of a large account, every single number in one column and their tariff and price in another. This is then being attached to the contract and they have asked for their clients to sign it. It's then attached to the contract and it gives full clarity and protection for the partner of a straight through process documenting every number that is being required to be re-signed or connected brand new on an account. Going back up, as we've said, box number five with the make and model mobile SIM card, etc. There isn't enough room and we have over on the right hand side in boxes 10 and 11 clarified there are 10 numbers. We don't necessarily have 10 boxes. So see continuation sheet for extra lines or you can do what some partners do and list all the numbers in the box and the tariffs at the end. It's completely up to you. But in the interest of complete clarity, we do advise that you use one of these options. One thing not to place in the special instructions box is something we've touched on at the top of the page. Remember I said you don't need to put a delivery address into the contract unless you are ordering hardware from O2 directly. The same goes for box 15. If you are ordering hardware independently from O2 through either Chess or a third party supplier, you do not need to put the hardware requirement on the special instructions form. It's not being provided by the network. You are providing that. So as long as that features on a purchase order between you and your customer, and there is a documentation process for you to show they asked for and you supplied the hardware, then unless supplied by O2, you do not need to place how many handsets that you are supplying them with and any costs on the special instructions box. And finally, for a new account, please bear in mind that you will need to give an indication of a preferred payment option, direct debit, credit card, check or backs. Now, what we do see quite a lot is we do see a request for a direct debit, but then we do not see that information replicated on the automation hub. Please note, if you do select direct debit for your customer, then you will need to give that information in the below direct debit instruction get a signature and you will also need to pop that information on the automation hub in the applicable boxes at the top of the automation hub page. If your client opts to pay by backs, please make them aware that there can be a lag time between their bank and O2 receiving the payment. So they need to make sure they automate and time their payments to prevent barring. If for some reason a contract is let through the vetting process without any instruction on payment, please note, it will automatically default to backs. This is rare, but it can happen as with all automation. So please bear that in mind. Finally, the declaration. Make sure your client signs it either digitally or by hand. You can fill out this contract in a digital form, print it off and have them hand sign it. You can print the contract out blank, fill it out by hand and get them to hand sign it. But best practice from O2 states that you do not fill half of it in digitally and half of it in by hand. There needs to be an either or continua continuality throughout the contract, either digital or by hand. The only exception being the signature does not have to be DocuSign or eSign. It can be by hand. And that's just to confirm again, we get a lot of questions. Can DocuSign be used? The answer is yes. 
Make sure you've got the date as well. And remember that you only need to have a second signature on this page if they're filling out credit card details. We often see it quite a bit. Direct debit instructions to refresh will need a signature. And then very, very lastly, but not least, some general terms and conditions for business customers. States full terms and conditions at o2.com. It's worth noting as well that uh, if you want to contact myself, then I'd also have a further in-depth uh, O2 terms and conditions and they've kindly split everything up into a uh, type of request so there's terms and conditions on roaming that are separate from say terms and conditions on billing so if you want any further information you can find it out yourself at o2.com or contact me for more information so that runs us through the O2 contract, what we need to see for best practice. If you do have any questions, then do feel free to ask myself or your chess partner BDM or the partner sales desk. All three of us will be happy to help if you've got any queries filling out your contract. But remember, the most important thing is the information must pertain to the deal with O2, things that are supplied by O2, and the promise that you are making to your partner must line up with the purchase order and proposal that they have agreed. It's common sense, but you'd be surprised how many times things get rejected on a digit missing, a line of an address missing, or a missing signature. Best of luck, and I'll see you on the next video.